Did you say that we're on your syllabi? You are. What? <laughs> ah! What do you mean? <laughs> I'm teaching a course. I'm t I'm teaching a course called Cannabis as Catalyst, as a means to think about like lots of other social and historical problems. And I've put a couple of the podcasts on the syllabus. I feel like we're really, really <laughs> making it now. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Different Leaf, the podcast, a show for new and experienced cannabis consumers. I'm Britt Smith. This episode, we're going to hear the story of a five-year-old boy called Lionel, who has a rare form of epilepsy known as infantile spasms or West syndrome that has been well controlled for most of his life now by cannabidiol, better known as the non-intoxicating cannabis compound CBD. Lionel started having seizures in 2016 when he was less than six months old. He was initially put on a long list of heavy pharmaceutical drugs that seemed to be doing more harm than good. So Lionel's parents made the difficult decision to try CBD, which they'd heard at the time from other parents was really working for their kids' seizures, but had not been widely studied by the scientific community. Thankfully, Lionel started showing improvements within that same day. Like thousands of other families, Lionel's parents were thrilled to discover through the citizen scientists of the world that CBD is a viable medicine for some truly awful and rare medical disorders, including infantile spasms. In the summer 2021 issue of Different Leaf the magazine, which you can find at differentleaf.com, you'll find our guest for today's episode, Lionel's mum, Professor Caroline Melly, an author and associate professor of anthropology at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, whose research now focuses on the making of modern cannabis medicine. <music> professor Melly, can you tell me a little bit about what you do, uh, what your research involves? I think it's important to start actually where my research used to be, in a sense. I was trained as an urban anthropologist and did research in West Africa, uh, Dakar, Senegal, for quite a few years, wrote a book, many articles that all focused on urban life and migration in particular in the bustling capital city of, of Dakar. And my research since then has shifted to the making of cannabis science. And I'm really in particular interested in the ways that a sort of unexpected agglomeration of people are, are working together to shape that science in ways that, that might not be really readily visible to the, to the larger public. I'm in particular interested in the ways that caregivers and people with disabilities and other cannabis users are working to shape that science from below and the ways that those sort of dynamic processes are in fact, you could say, trickling up instead of trickling down, right, right? and shaping the way the science is being built from above as well. So tell me a bit about the story of how this started for you specifically, because I know that you have a very personal connection to uh, cannabis medicine. I do indeed. If you had told me in 2015 that I would be on a podcast about cannabis, I don't think that I ever would have believed you. <laughs> um, I didn't really have too much of a relationship, to be completely honest with you, um, before um, 2016. In 2015, my son was born, my son Lionel. When he was just five months old, two days after I got tenure at my institution, when he awoke, he had a cluster of seizures in my arms at 5 a.m. Oh and I turned to my husband at that moment and said, life is about to forever change because I knew exactly what it was. The diagnosis was infantile spasms. Um, which is a catastrophic form of epilepsy that literally steals a child's development. Um, basically, the brain is in a constant pattern of disarray, sort of like a computer that can never start up. It's constantly shutting down over and over. Just a week before that is when I saw the initial symptoms that he seemed a little withdrawn and cranky and was losing milestones. And so I had done some digging. I had not seen a single seizure, but I had done some digging to try to figure out what it was. 
And that's when I discovered infantile mm -hmm. spasms and took a huge breath of relief at the time thinking the kid has never had a seizure. So this must be something else. This must be teething or some kind of developmental stage. Sure enough, March 7th, 2016, I saw our first cluster of seizures. And after that, in the months that were to follow, he would have hundreds and hundreds of seizures all day long, every single day. Oh my gosh, that must have been terrifying for you. It was the single most defining and catastrophic moment of my life. There is nothing that has defined who I am today in the way that these seizures had. So what did the doctors initially tell you was going to be the treatment for him? Because five months old, that's incredibly tiny. What was their approach? Incredibly tiny. Our first round of medication was a drug called ACTH, which has been in the news quite a bit over the past decade for various controversies. It's a drug that is used to stimulate the adrenal system. It's used much like a high-dose steroid. The amount of drug that he was on it far surpasses what a, you know, a 40-year-old would be on for something like lupus, for yeah. instance. So he was on a, an incredible dose of this medication. The drug company has gotten a lot of admittedly bad press over the past decade or so, because when they bought the drug, they hiked the price something like uh, 97,000% oh or something. God. So it went from being $40 a vial to maybe twenty-five dollars or $30,000 <gasps> a vial overnight. Oh my good yes. Lord. Absolutely astonishing. By the time we used that drug in 2016, it was $45,000 a vial, and we needed three vials in order to complete the therapy. And it failed. <laughs> it failed spectacularly. The side effects were horrific. He developed adrenal issues as a result of it that lasted for over a year. He screamed nonstop on the drug. And this was just the beginning. After that, we were put on drug after drug after drug, including benzodiazepines, which are known to be highly addictive in adult mm -hmm. populations and have not been studied in pediatric patients under the age of two. And so for the first year of his life, he was on a truly extraordinary mix of drugs that pretty much took our baby away from us altogether. He barely had head control. Though he learned to sit, he, he sat with his head sagging down because he couldn't hold it up because of the drugs. He was not very present with us most of the time. He slept, but then had trouble sleeping at night and was up all night screaming. It was an incredibly difficult several months as we finally gained control of the seizures. And in that time, from the time that we were first diagnosed and he was developmentally on track to the time we got control of the seizures, he basically lost all development and became like an infant oh, wow. again. This must have been such an emotional time for you. What were your steps towards sort of learning more about it on your own and, and taking control a little bit of, uh, I guess, mother's intuition, which is something that you found in a, in a community of mothers who had also found cannabis products to be helpful for their children? That's right. Prior to this, I was actually not a Facebook user. I didn't really use social media at all. But I reached out to a father that I had found online in an old, now defunct support group. He called me just in the days after my son's diagnosis and encouraged me to join Facebook and join a group of caregivers there. It was within this extraordinary group of humans that I first began to understand that people were using CBD to treat their children's mm -hmm. epilepsy, which led to joining various other groups as well. Initially, I remember it was my sister's husband, my brother-in-law, who first suggested, as it was clear that my son was failing frontline treatments, to use cannabis or to use CBD. But I remember telling him, that's something you only use if the case is really mm -hmm. dire. Like, we don't want to end up in those shoes. It became clear as the months went on, though, that it was going to be difficult to get control. We finally did get control on a cocktail of meds. But he was in such bad developmental condition as a result and really was not aware of us at all at that point that that's when my husband and I decided we would give CBD a try. 
the hope being that it would keep him stable enough, that maybe it would help his development and that we could slowly wean the drugs. So I joined a bunch of cannabis related groups online as well, as well as the infantile spasms group I was in. This was all, of course, as my own research agenda in Africa was falling apart. But I'm someone who's always been interested in the production of science and technology. And I began to see unfolding in front of me something that was truly extraordinary, Mm -hmm. that there existed an expertise in these spaces of desperation and sort of advocacy that I truly never knew existed. And so it was quite to the contrary, both of the reports you would hear about what cannabis is or what it could do, especially to children on the outside, but also quite contrary to, you know, much of what I was hearing about pharmaceutical development in the area of cannabis. And I really came to the conclusion that I wanted to tell the story of the ways in which these heroic folks were actually shaping cannabis as a science and that it was not the pharmaceutical companies doing so. So there's a lot of stories I think folks have heard, especially ones out of Colorado, where parents would move to Colorado from all around the U.S. Folks would move to Colorado if they had sick kids who could benefit from the somewhat legality of cannabis in that state because it was one of the earliest states. And we all remember Charlotte Figgy, who was the young lady who she was splashed all over the news as a kid with somebody with epilepsy. And her parents had moved her there to try CBD to help her seizures. And we heard all these sort of really heart wrenching stories about how parents had to uproot themselves and, you know, try this medicine that had been almost folklore up until that point. What was it like putting your faith in this community of almost underground scientists who'd come together and figured out that certain things that weren't necessarily legal in their state, but really worked as medicine for your kid. I feel like that Sanjay Gupta TV special, Weed, um, was a a sort of turning point for many of these communities. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was certainly something that I had in the back of my mind, knowing Charlotte's story quite early on as I ventured in. Um, you know, many of the children initially that uh, at least appeared in the media that were benefiting from cannabis were quite um, developmentally disabled and had a range of really serious health issues. So when you initially enter the community, I I think it's a little shocking and you're kind of hoping that perhaps you're in the wrong Mm -hmm. place, Mm -hmm. right? That perhaps what you're treating is is not something so serious and that you're going to find some quick and easy solution. Mm -hmm. So I think I entered with complete trepidation, also as the kid of the war on drugs in a way, right? And the sort of dare say no to to drugs movement in the United States in the 80s and 90s. This just wasn't sort of the imaginary of my child's life that I had. But I can remember when the package arrived and when we finally gave him his first dose of CBD, I remember, you know, shaking and being utterly terrified of what was to come. And yet, Within the next couple of hours, we could already see in really incredibly subtle ways a sort of spark about him that we hadn't seen. And I tell everyone that it was actually in dosing cannabis and in slowly being able to remove those drugs that we were able to meet our child for the very first time, that I had never met him. I had never known what he was possible of or the sort of exuberance of his personality or his connection And this is exactly why these groups function as they do. The sort of balance and hope that it brings to families' lives is truly transformative. And so this is what I was seeing unfolding in these sort of underground communities, many of which you need, you know, a password to join in the Facebook world. They're not, you're not even able to unearth them unless you know where to look and how to do so and receive an invitation to do so. But I have to say that in the time from which Lionel was diagnosed in 2016 until now, things have changed enormously, and it's much more out in the open. Physicians, epileptologists, neurologists are much more likely to condone its use and to stand behind it. And many of those epileptologists who are now working on cannabis as a legitimate treatment for epilepsy will tell you that they owe much of this science to families. How old was Lionel when you first gave him that first dose of CBD? He was about eight or nine months old. It was the summer of 2016. I had tried 
unsuccessfully multiple times to bring up with our neurologist's office through the nurses there that I wanted to talk to our neurologist, our epileptologist, um, about using it. And each and every time, the nurses didn't deliver the message. And they simply told me, it is far too risky. We don't know what it does to a developing mm -hmm. brain. He's an infant, which of course added to my fears at the time, even though I knew that Anfi, the benzodiazepine he was on, is not tested in his right. age group. And it's known to have highly addictive potentiality within adult populations. And I had seen